We've been preaching for most of this year, I would I, I think, on the need and the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. We have emphasized how desperately we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is not merely a nice addendum to the Christian faith. That's a mistake to think that. It's the heart and core of it. The Holy Spirit is absolutely central to the Christian life. His role is an indispensable factor in determining whether we will be a failure or a success as a Christian. Amen? So I think we need the Holy Spirit. But the sad truth is that the Holy Spirit is little recognized as such in most churches today. We, we don't, we fail in most churches to see the need for the Holy Spirit. I think this would be a good time to quote the great pastor Jack Hiles again as we did earlier in this series. He says the following, one of the most grievous things that one can endure is to be ignored. How grieved then must the Holy Spirit be? For to be ignored has been his lot for these many centuries. He who is the indweller of the believer, the anointer of the anointed, the power of the pulpit and the fullness of power for the believer continues to go about his work with little or no acknowledgement or attention. Few sermons are preached about him. Fewer books are written of him, yet he quietly continues to offer us leadership, comfort, wisdom, strength, teaching, and power. Wow. Wow. Allow me to quickly review what we have covered to this point. In John chapter 14, we learned how Jesus introduced the ministry of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He reveals to them that he is going away, that he he is going to the cross, but he assures them, gives them a promise that he will not leave them comfortless. He will not abandon them. He will not leave them as orphans, but he will send back the Holy Spirit. He then uh, he says this of regarding the Spirit. He says, when He comes, He's going to lead you, and He's going to guide you into all truth. He will enable you to be a witness uh, in the world in, in, in spite of the opposition. He will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. He will never speak of Himself. He will always glorify, Jesus said, Himself. He'll glorify not the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. Jesus said these things the night before he would be crucified. So they're very important, these things that he's saying to his, his disciples. He, he wanted them to understand how desperately they were going to need the ministry of the Holy Spirit when he le- left them, and hence that applies to all of us. He told them that the Spirit has been with you, he said, but when I, when he comes back, when I leave, he's going to come back and he's going to be within you. Amen. Within us. After his resurrection, before his ascension, he says, he says when he was here on the earth for those 40 days, he said, tarry ye here in Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high. And indeed, 10 days later, they, they, after he had made that statement, 10 days later, they were empowered. They went forth as witnesses. They, a conviction accompanied their preaching. Thousands were saved. The sick were healed. Miracles happened. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had indeed come. Can you say amen? We continue preaching about the importance of the Holy Spirit from there and talked about the the importance of being filled with the Spirit, to be influenced by, to be controlled by the Spirit. And then we talked about uh, the uh, walking in the Spirit, the role the Spirit has in producing fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, self-control, faith uh, uh, in our individual lives. The Holy Spirit gives us power to live like Jesus wants us to live. Can you say amen? Now, We focus our attention to the gifts of the Spirit, His gracious bestowments. It seems to me that in a series regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, we would be remiss without including the gifts that He gives. It would be just an incomplete message. Hence the Spirit's gifts. Now let me just say this first and say it unequivocally. 
The gifts of the Spirit are still available today. There is no scripture that teaches otherwise none whatsoever. However, the abuse of those gifts and the wrong emphasis on certain gifts have caused many to shy away from that which the Holy Spirit gives. Would you agree with that? For example, and I just want to use this as an example. It's kind of, I think, an extreme example, but I want to use it for an example. Uh, Just a few years ago in Lakeland, Florida, there was a so-called revival going on where a man claimed to have the gift of of healing, and uh, he was kicking people in the stomach. Uh, I I saw my own eyes claiming that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, told him to kick an old lady in the face so that she would be healed, and he even drop-kicked a pastor. One man lost his tooth. Friend, that's not the Holy Spirit. I have to admit, before I'm finished with this sermon, some of you might want to drop kick me. I don't know. Folks, this is so bad that you don't really need discernment to know it's wrong. Yet thousands, tens of thousands flock to the meetings. It was all over. It was the big thing. And they were deceived by what was going on. It was a false anointing, making a mockery out of the true anointing of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, not surprisingly, moral failure put an end to the revival, so-called revival. The pastor, I can hear some of you thinking, how do you know? How can you be so sure? Well, simply put, it does not line up with the word of Almighty God. That's how I can be sure. A.W. Tozer, what a great writer. He writes to his critics, and I concur. He says, if an archangel from heaven were to come and were to start giving me, telling me, teaching me, and giving me instruction, I'd ask him for the text. I'd say, where's that say that in the Bible? I want to know, and I would insist that it was according to the Scriptures because I do not believe in any extra scriptural teachings nor any anti-scriptural teachings or any subscriptural teachings. I think we ought to put the emphasis where God puts it and continue to put it there and to expound the Scriptures and stay by the Scriptures. He says, I wouldn't, no matter if I saw a light above the light of the sun, I'd keep my mouth shut about it until I'd check with Daniel and Revelation and the rest of the Scriptures to see if there was any basis in the truth. The last time I checked, I I haven't found yet where kicking was a method of healing. I did see where prayer and laying upon hands and anointing with all and the prayer of faith were biblical methods of healing in the Bible. Now, let let me address this further. Some like to make the statement, God can do anything. And, and then they'll follow with this, can't he? As if, though, are you going to challenge this? And the answer is, certainly, God has the power to do anything. But he will not do anything contrary to his word or his nature. This would include anything we experience with God. If it, if it isn't an experience that's found in the Word of God, it must be rejected. Or at least we must put it on the shelf till we can do further investigation. Otherwise, we are standing in a sea of subjectivity with nothing to base our belief on. In other words, it's subject to our opinion. That, my friend, is a very dangerous path to trod. And many have trod that path. I've yet to find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus or anybody else ever drop kicked a pastor or kicked an old lady in the face. However, healing is an experience found in the Bible. Miracles are found in the Bible. Speaking in tongues is an experience found in the Bible. Lifting up your hands and praising God, you can find that in the Bible. Dancing before the Lord with all your might, you can find that in the Bible. Leaping and praising the Lord after a great miracle of healing is found in the Bible. Let me just say this. If you were lame from your mother's womb and Jesus Christ healed you, you'd go leaping and jumping and praising God too. I know I would. Amen? So, so the religious spirit that we all, we, we need to get rid of that religious spirit and get back to what the Word says. 
Being filled with the Spirit is found, an experience found in the Bible. So folks, love me, hate me. This is my motto, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, Bible. I refuse to be subject to your opinion, your church tradition, a denomination, or what's politically correct. I subject myself to the Word of Almighty God. Amen? And while I'm at it, let me just add this. We, we need to have a fundamental understanding of the nature of God. You know, our problem is we don't really know God. We don't know who he is. We don't know what he's like. We, we just preached a message on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, etc. That's what the Holy Spirit is like. That's what he's like. That's what Jesus is like. That's what God the Father is like. Uh, when the Holy Spirit, Jesus said... Uh, I'll send another comforter in the word, in the Greek is alas, another. It means one just like me, not somebody different than me, somebody just like me. And let me tell you, Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Jesus was not violent, and neither is the Spirit of God. He never desired to hurt anybody. He always desired to save and to heal and to set free. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And here's what Jesus and the Spirit were doing. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are, that, that, that are bruised, who've been bruised by life, who are imprisoned by the difficulties of life, who have went through all kinds of things in life. That's what Jesus is like, and that's what the Holy Spirit's like, and that's what they're doing. Can you say Say amen. On the other hand, Jesus himself was attacked violently and put on a cross because of the good works he did. So let me ask you something. Has God, has he not said in Ephesians chapter 5, or instructed us to, to love our wives as Christ loved the church? Is that not the instruction for every, every husband? I say yes, and we know it is from the word. I ask you this, would you kick your wife in the stomach or would you kick her in the face? And the answer is absolutely not. First of all, some of you are afraid of your wives and you would never dare. Secondly, though, the real reason for it is because you love her, you would never do such a thing. And neither will God kick his bride in the face. You see, we need to know who God is and what he's like. We need to know the nature of God, and then we would just discount a lot of the foolishness that goes on in the name of the Holy Spirit. It's not his nature, and he will never do anything contrary to his nature. We need to know who God is. Remember, the Antichrist is coming with signs and wonders. You'll be very charismatic, folks. It's how he deceives people, and that's how people are deceived today. So when we see things done in the name of the Holy Spirit or uh, see things uh, when, when things are done in the name of the Holy Spirit and, and we cannot back them up by the Scripture, we reject it out of hand. But if it is scriptural, that is, if it's taken in its proper context, if it's not contrary to the nature of God, we must be very, very careful that we do not find ourselves resisting the power of God. You hear me? See, now I'm on the other side of the fence, so I made some of you mad over here, and I'm going to make some of you mad over here. Right? That's okay. I said, Lord, I'm okay with suffering if it's for the truth, if it's for righteousness' sake. Just don't let me say something stupid and then suffer for it. All right? So, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, you would think they would like those great miracles and wonders, but it caused a great stir among those who, who finally took him before the council. Here's what Stephen said to the council in chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. 
I don't want to ever be guilty of resisting the Holy Ghost to oppose, to strive against him. I don't want to ever grieve him, quench him, vex him, or ever blaspheme him. Certainly not. I need him. I love him. And I cannot make it in this Christian walk without him. Amen? I don't want to ever resist the work of the Holy Spirit. I need that work in my life. And whether you realize it or not, you do too. What others do does not change the word of God, not one iota. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because some people use prayer beads, it's not going to stop me from praying. Hello? Because some people claim to be spirit-filled, handle snakes. I'm not going to stop being a spirit-filled Christian. I'm not handling any snakes either. Why? Because it's not in the Word, not the way they take it. And so what happens when we, when we stop because of the, the excesses uh, or the, 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 the things that people do in the name of the Spirit that are wrong? When we say, well, I don't want anything to do with it, and we go the other direction, guess what? Satan wins. I want everything that God has for me. I don't want anything more, and I don't want anything less. Whatever it is, I can assure you, it will line up with the Word of God. Let's look at the biblical view of what the Spirit gives. Paul begins here in our morning text, and he says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. The word ignorant, uh, it's a, a, a Greek word is related to the word agnostic. The modern slang term would be ignoramus. I don't want you to be that way is what Paul's saying. It means to be without knowledge or understanding or to be mistaken and by implication, it can mean to ignore. Obviously, there, there, there is an ignorance of what the gifts of the Spirit really are today as there were in Paul's day. People don't understand, they're mistaken, or they just ignore that. Just, we just ignore that part. Preachers ignore it. Pastors, the, the people, the denominations ignore it. But it's in the Word. Paul didn't want the Corinthian believers to be ignorant about the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church. And if Paul were here today, he would no doubt express the same wish. He would be appalled at what people are doing in the name of the Holy Spirit. And likewise, he would be appalled at those who reject his operation. Ignorance, my friend, is not always bliss. Ignorance can be a very bad thing. Ignorance is certainly true of those who we have mentioned who abuse or overemphasize certain gifts. But likewise, a lack of understanding is evident from, uh, on, those, on, the, on the other side of the fence. They don't believe it at all. Some even will go as far as to say that the days of miracles are over. And, and, and it has gained popularity, not because the Scriptures back it up, no, but because it offers a ready excuse for why the church is so anemic and does not operate in the supernatural today. It is far easier to claim that the days of miracles are over than to admit that they're still available and that the church lacks the devotion and the faith necessary to see it happen today. That's right. Come on now. Oh, yeah. we got to have a reason to, 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 to excuse our, our lack in verses 7 through 11, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the gifts or the manifestations of the Spirit are valid. I, I really don't know how one can come to any other conclusion. It's right in the Word. Now, I'll talk about how they do here in just a moment. But he says in chapter 12, verse 7, in our morning text, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man the prophet with all. And here's where, where, herein lies a lot of the problems. People want to be seen. And they do things, and it's all about them. And we got the super apostles, and we got the super this and the super that. I want to tell you, when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, you don't advertise it. He just works in our lives, and he does it. And we always glorify Jesus in it. And when man's being glorified and people are flocking to a man, you can be sure that's not of God. Come on now. Huh? 
So we're, we're going to stop. Okay, he says in verse 8, 4, to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that, the one, that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will the Holy Spirit is the one that distributes the manifestations at his will and his desire. We're just vessels. Now, obviously, one cannot deny, you can't look at the Scripture and, can, and, and say and contend that the gifts are not in the Bible. I mean, you, what are you going to do? you got to rip the page out. You can't say that. It's plain to see they are there. So it can't be denied. So if one does not believe, then... What must one do? And that's the, the, they, they must explain it away somehow. And there has to be some kind of explanation. So the question is how? And I want you to see just how they do that. Some claim that miracle gifts and supernatural manifestations were withdrawn at the close of the apostolic age around 100 A.D. God, God just used the, used the gifts and the manifestations of the Spirit to get a struggling young church on its feet. And then once the church was established, God snatched away the power. That's weak. That's fake news. Yeah, that's wrong. (laughs) You got to come up with something better than that, but they can. Others claim that at the completion of the canon of of, of, of Scripture, when the New Testament ended at it was also signaled the end of the supernatural. Once the New Testament was complete, God's revelation was finished. So the Holy Spirit gave uh, gave up performing miracles and today confines his activity to the written word. That's also weak. That's fake news. Huh? That's fake. That's wrong. That's weak. Oh, boy. <laughs> These folks use 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 to support their argument. So let's, you know, they're, they're, they're otherwise intelligent people. But when you're trying to desperately explain something away, you've got to come up with something. So here, here's where they go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, charity or love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So they stop right there, and there they claim, and we're not going to stop. We're going to continue on. That's, that's the problem. They stop here. And they claim this means that when the New Testament was completed, the gifts were no longer needed. Now, here's, here's how one mistaken theologian explains it, one that... Is well res- respected, I guess. When Scripture is completed, he said, then the church will have revelation thoroughly suited to her condition on earth. Our completed Bible is perfect in the sense that it is utterly sufficient revelation for all our needs. When the sufficient one comes, the inadequate and partial one will be done away. Tongues will vanish, knowledge and prophecies will cease at the time that the New Testament is finished. So according to these people, cessationalists is what they, they're called, when the perfect comes, means when the perfect New Testament comes in their mind, that's how they're trying to explain this away. That means the gifts are done away, were done away with when the New Testament was completed. But is that what Paul means? By being per- the perfect one? or the, 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 is it, He means the New Testament? Here's the other view, the one I subscribe to. It says that the coming of the perfect refers to the experience of perfection that we will experience at the return of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, you have to read the Scripture in its entire context. Let's read the remainder of the passage in its context, okay? Now, let me start back where where they start in verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Then he goes on to say, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. So Paul's comparing the experience of partial prophecy and knowledge to the experience of childhood. And he compares the passing away of the gifts to the experience of adulthood. But that that doesn't decide for us the issue. 
let's look at verse 12 because it does very plainly. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly. Right now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then, but when? Then, when, we, when we're face to face, then shall I know even also as also I am known. So now we see what Paul's referring to. He's referring to the time when we shall see Jesus face to face. For I know in part, I don't have full knowledge right now, but then I shall understand all, know fully, even as I'm known. Now we see through a glass darkly, a mirror darkly, but then face to face. I ask you, is it more likely that Paul is saying, now before the New Testament is written, we shall see through a mirror darkly, but now that the New Testament is written, we shall see face to face? Or is it more likely that he is saying, now in this age we see through a glass, a mirror darkly, but then when the Lord returns, we shall see face to face. See, I believe you got it. It's not real hard, is it? We just got to read the Scripture in its totality. In heaven, Revelation 22, 4 says, and they shall see his face. First John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There is coming a day we'll be face to face. So you see what's at stake in these two interpretations. If the coming of the perfect in verse 10 refers to the finishing of the New Testament, then the gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge have all passed away because that time came 1,900 years ago. But if the coming of the perfect in verse 10 refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ, then the natural understanding of the text is that the gifts will continue until Jesus comes. Therefore, we'll work till Jesus comes empowered by the Holy Spirit. My friend, do you really think that we need the gift of faith less than they did? Are you serious? How about discerning of spirits? Do you really think we need that less today than they needed it? How about miracles? How about healing? Oh, they needed it worse than we need today. Are you serious? My conclusion is that the contrast between seeing fuzzily in an old mirror and seen face to face is not a contrast between first century spiritual knowledge and the knowledge we have from the New Testament today, but rather it's a contrast between the imperfect knowledge that we have today in this age and the awesome personal knowledge we will have when we see Jesus face to face. So what does this mean? It means that the spiritual gifts have not passed away. It means they will be available and needful until Jesus comes. Folks, we need everything the Holy Spirit has for us. Are you kidding? Do you think we need it less than they did? We're living in an evil world. I mean, we've got people, the actors that are talking about, uh, are talking about uh, assassinating our president and they're, and they're getting by with it and doing things that are so evil. Others, congressmen are, and people in political parties are saying they wish the guy that got shot the other day would just die. He deserved it. We have political pundits saying these kind of things or, or, or media. Lib, and it's, it's like, what are you? You think we don't need the Holy Spirit today? The, the, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. I want to tell you, we need everything God has for us. Everything. When you think about it, this all parallels, the, when you talk about the gifts, it parallels the particulars of the Old Covenant, the symbols of the Old Testament, uh, uh, i.e. the sacrifices, the circumcision, etc., were done away with. Those things were no longer needed after the Lord came and fulfilled them. Likewise, the gifts are in part because one day they'll no longer be necessary. Let me tell you, folks, when I see Jesus, I won't need healing. <laughs> There's no sickness in heaven. Uh, I, I'm not going to need discerning of spirits when I see him. There's no evil in heaven. 
No sin will enter there. I don't need knowledge and wisdom. I'm going to be with the omniscient one, the one who knows everything. I won't need it then, but oh, we need it now. We need it now. So this is, this is part one. Which side of the fence are you on or are you with the word? What are we, what are we to do until we see him face to face? What are we to do? Paul gives us instructions. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, follow after charity, love, and desire spiritual gifts. That's what we're supposed to do. Not ignore it. Not neglect it. Not resist it. We're to desire spiritual gifts. And as Paul closes, starts closing out the section on gifts, he says this in verse 38, chapter 14. It's interesting. He says, starts with this and he ends with, kind of ends here. He says, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. (laughs) He didn't want him to be ignorant. But if they will be, if you're without understanding after what he's said, if you're mistaken, you're uninterested, Paul says, well, then let them be ignorant. Then he says in verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet desire to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues but then he says in verse 40 let all things be done decently and in order translation don't forbid the gifts but make sure they're not misused there's a right way and there's a wrong way i don't want to be i don't want to be resisting what god's wanting to do I don't want to be abusing what God wants to do. Can I get to heaven if I don't understand the gifts? Well, yes. Sure, missing out. And you certainly don't want to fight against what the Spirit does and gives. You, you You should desire those gifts. You should desire them. However, There is one gift. Yes, you can get to heaven without. Get to heaven without the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing. You get to heaven, but there's one gift you do not want to be without. The one gift I speak of is necessary to get to heaven. That's the gift of salvation. God's gift of salvation, like all of God's gifts, it's unmerited. It's totally of His grace. It was made possible through the sinless life and the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ who took our place on the cross. If you trust in Him as the one who died for you, who took your punishment and paid your sin debt, you can receive by faith the gift of salvation. Your requirement is realize your need and believe. And you who are saved should desire all that the Holy Spirit has for you in the way of gifts, fruit, power. His gifts are to bless others, His body. His fruit has been given in order that we would live right, treat others right. There are gifts of the Spirit, and there is fruit of the Spirit. We don't want to exclude either one of those. If they're both of the Spirit, I think we need 